Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening. My name is Elizabeth. I'm a master's student here in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning um, and a co-organizer of the New Economy at MIT student group. Um, and on behalf of all of the members of our group, um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the sixth talk in our spring speaker series, Building the New Economy. Um, if you haven't attended one of our events this semester, we're a new cross-departmental student-led working group, um, which formed this year to bring together students, faculty, and leading <coughs> practitioners, such as GAR, working on issues of how to create a more sustainable and equitable economic system. And we've been exploring this through student-led reading groups and a lunch discussion series. Um, as the keynote of our speaker series, we're really thrilled to be able to host Carl Perwitz this evening, an acclaimed historian, political economist, think tank founder, activist, and one of the most prominent voices in the new economy movement, particularly in regards to the development of new institutional forms to support the decentralization, relocalization, and democratization of wealth and ownership. Um, welcome, and there might be a few people straggling in, but that's it. <laughs> 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 it's okay. <laughs> um, Alperovitz is the Lionel R. Bauman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland, a founding fellow of Harvard's Institute of Politics, a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, and a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. He's also a former fellow of King's College in Cambridge. He served as the Legislative Director in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate as a special assistant in the Department of State. And along with sociologist Ted Howard in 2000, he co-founded the Democracy Collaborative at the University of Maryland, which served as the thought incubator for Cleveland's pioneering evergreen cooperatives. Um, Gar's numerous articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, the New Republic, the Nation, and the Atlantic, among many other publications. And his most recent books are American, America Beyond Capitalism, Reclaiming Our Wealth, Our Liberty, and Our Democracy, Unjust Desserts, Wealth Inequality and the Knowledge Economy, and a Making, Making Place for Community, Local Democracy in a New Era. Um, tonight's talk is part of his tour for his most recent book, which you have here. It's What, what Then Must We Do? Straight Talk About the Next American Revolution. So without much further ado, um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Gar um, to MIT, and we really look forward to his presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I never quite know what questions are in people's minds, so you have to forgive me. I had a very good talk this afternoon with two founders of this group, and they told me what the questions were. But I suspect there's a different question. Am I sound okay, or is it? I suspect there's a different question that I should address first. And by way of introduction, because the question I want to address is controversial and politically difficult, and maybe even challenging, I want to underline one small feature of my past career. Um, I have been a hard-nosed pop. I must acknowledge that. I have worked in the House and the Senate, and I've run ordinary campaigns, and I've been there and done that, so I at least have a small sense of what it means to operate day by day in the real world of American politics. Uh, that having been said, I want to talk to you about how we transform the system. Now that's a different question from how we elect somebody and how we pass legislation and how we do new policies and even how we do exciting new projects that might lead somewhere, though all of those might be involved in the question of changing the system. But I think the starting point for most people is how do you know the difference between an ordinary political problem and a systemic crisis, or even a systemic problem? What, what does that mean? And I think by way of starting to think about that conversation, one thing to notice is that long, long trends that do not respond significantly to political demands, organizing, elections, policy requests, etc., tell you at least minimally that there is something far deeper at work in the system, in the bowels of the system, generating outcome trends that don't seem to respond to politics. That's a good starting point, I think. So, for instance, as many of you know, but I'm asking you now to think 
in two ways about this that you may not have thought about. Many of you know there's a political crisis in Washington, and there is the Tea Party, and there is a stalemate in the Washington fights that Obama is going through. That looks like a political problem. But if you stand back and you say, there has been virtually no change whatsoever in the actual earned income of ordinary workers for 30 years, give or take tiny little fractions, you know that something else, not the Tea Party, and not Obama's failings, is causing something to give you that long trend. Or for instance, if you see that virtually, this is a staggering one, virtually all of the gains in the political economic system for the last 30 years have been allocated to the top 1%, give or take some fractions. Now, that is a phenomenon not easily explained by one election or one failure or one Tea Party group. It tells you if there is a 30-year trend, something deeper is causing the problem. So for instance, and to take that number just a little further, the top, these are numbers you probably know about, but maybe haven't thought of in terms of systemic analysis. The top 1% has gone over 30 years from roughly 10% of the income, and it's able to garner now, depending upon the denominator of the fraction, 22 to 24% of the income. <coughs> Just think about that. Virtually all of the income has gone to the top 1%. Something that generates a trend like that is deeper than politics. It is anchored somehow in the operations of deeper structures and institutions that we call the system, or the political economic system, or the economic system. So for instance, if CO2 emissions have gone up 30% over the last 25 years, regularly, ongoingly, something is creating that. Or if you look at the question, which most people don't, of liberty. Now liberty can be dealt with in terms of civil rights and civil liberties and legal decisions of the court. But I think a, uh, what used to be called where I'm from in Wisconsin, a down dirty and down home measure is how many people lose their liberty, <coughs> are put in prison or in jail. We are seven or eight times the percent of the population in prison than, the Russian, than Russia or far more than China. And it has gone steadily up for the last 30 years. The numbers are stag staggering. So I could go on with this kind of discussion, but I suggest to you that one way to understand the problem we now face is to move away from politics for a moment and move away from projects for a moment and consider the possibility that you are living in a crisis of the entire political economic system. Now what do you do with a crisis of a political economic system? What does that mean? What do you do with that thing, if so? even if you accept the possibility that that's the problem. And what is a system for the purposes of this short lecture? What is it and how do we begin to describe it? Well, traditionally, in very simple terms, but they're pretty good terms, system de designs have depended largely historically on who gets to own the wealth. So that, that's not the only criteria, but it is a signal and critical criteria so that in feudalism, the land was owned by the lords and the king and, and the church, and most of the power went along with those guys who owned the land. So that was a particular systemic design. We're going to come back to that term. It is, rather than thinking about it in rhetorical terms, that's a particular way to design the institutional structure of a system. The land is controlled that way, and certain outcomes follow. So that in 19th century, American competitive capitalism, the capital and the wealth was largely owned by small businessmen. And they were mostly farmer businessmen, not women. They were mostly farmer businessmen. I want to emphasize that because we don't think of farmers as businessmen. They were, in fact, operating in a capitalist market, and a very difficult market, grain market particularly, that was it was a business market and they operated as business people as opposed, for instance, 
to the peasant structures that were left over in most European countries. And small business farming and small merchants and small capital and small banking was the central feature of the design of the political economic system. That was the systemic design. And it produced something like what Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics still write about, or the Chicago School writes about, a fairly competitive small business capitalism and it had certain certain particular features. By the way, one of them was a robust democracy. Very active Jacksonian democracy came from that. A third feature, and I'm trying to set up the argument as you can see in very, very quick terms. If you look at the former Soviet Union, the ownership of capital was largely in the state. And certain consequences followed. Among them, the loss of liberty and the loss of democracy and an ecological record that was extraordinarily bad. But the point was that if you concentrate the ownership, the conservatives are right about this, by the way. I come from the progressive side of the spectrum, obviously. But the conservatives are right to say that if you concentrate the ownership of wealth in a state, you will probably lose both democracy and liberty as a result of that particular systemic design. There are another, the bigger, the bigger mo models that we now know of and we live with today have to do with corporate capitalism. And, and they come in three flavors, at least, and I'll give them to you briefly. At the begin end of the 19th century, corporate capitalism was a fairly unrestrained structure where the dominant control was in the hands of major corporations, but not regulated and not broken up. It was a very powerful form of corporate domination. That's the late 19th century form. You tell me. Is there no volume on that? Sorry, we should just have a check team first. It's just the there's a reverb that is uh it's because the, the speakers are behind it. Is that because the speakers are there? Yeah. Alright, we'll leave it off, shall we? We'll turn it off. So if I'm not speaking loud enough for the person to hand, raise your hand, okay? So, is that okay for the <laughs> <laughs> All right, technology, <laughs> MIT. Well, no comment. Not the first time that happened. No comment. No comment. MI. Yeah, right, MI. <laughs> yeah. All right, where do we get? We got up to corporate capitalism, right? Okay. I'm giving you systemic designs in rather brief sketches, right? Uh, but and I mentioned that we're kind of getting to the pre preliminary punchline. The um, corporate capitalism came in that comes in three forms. Uh, the most obvious was strict, pure corporate capitalism without restraining the regulatory or break or, or antitrust capacities. 19th century, turn of the century, the dominant form. Again, I'm oversimplifying. The second form, most importantly and dangerously, was corporate capitalism in the form of fascism. The design of the system allocated major capital to the corporation, but it was allied with a system of repression called fascism. And indeed, fascist systems grew out of corporate capitalism and are a variant of corporate capitalism. The third form is the one that we have known and thought was our fate. Namely, corporate capitalism, where the dominant control of wealth at the center of the economy is, in fact, held by giant corporations, but in which they are regulated or broken up or managed, and in which taxing and spending allows for a modicum of social programming or environmental programming. That's what we thought we had. That's what we did have to a degree, always weaker by the way, than virtually all the other advanced industrial systems. The numbers now are staggering. We are way at the end of the trail on almost every major indicator. I could give you numbers if somebody asked me a question. They're just unbelievably low. But the point about that particular design in this country and abroad was that it depended on an institutional format and an institutional structure that kept the thing managed, sort of. And at the heart of that institutional systemic design, I'm going to keep saying that because I want to get back to it in different terms, was another institution that allowed a certain, what John Kenneth Galbraith called, countervailing power. 
And that institution was the institution of organized labor in unions. And the basis of the politics that we have come to think of as ordinary politics, it's muscle and power and money base from a balancing point of view was the American Union movement and American unions. And it's the same, same throughout Europe. The political science literature on this is pretty much unanimous. To the degree unions are powerful, to that degree social democratic <coughs> policies and environmental policies, surprisingly, in Europe and here have strength and power. And to the degree unions are weak, social democratic politics and or, or what we call liberalism is weak. So it's a particular, again, I'm, the, the point is it's a particular design. The capital gets to the corporations and you keep them in balance through policies, the undergirding of which comes from another institutional base called the ordinary union. Now here's the problem. That system is decaying right before your eyes. And in fact, I suspect we are in the last stages of that particular systemic design. Why? Most of you know the, the numbers of labor. American labor unions have always been extremely weak compared with European labor unions. I mean, the Swedes are up to 85% of the labor force in unions at one point. And the Europeans now run in the 40 to 50% range. Depends where you are. And the French have a variant, which is complicated by what happened after World War II. Small numbers, but they cover the whole, their, their sway covers the labor force in general. American labor unions peaked in 1953 at 34.5% of the labor force never very powerful compared with Sweden or Europe. And they have gone down almost in parallel with those trends. They are now at 11.6% in the total of the labor force. And in the private sector, 6.6% and declining. So you've got a problem right in your lap. If you understand the systemic design as based in an oversimplified way on who gets to control the capital on the one hand and whether there is an institutional capacity to alter the trends on the other based on power of an institution, that model, that systemic design is faltering before your eyes. It ain't about Obama and it's not about the Tea Party and it's not about what's going on because of corporate money, though they complicate the problem. It's about the underlying and undergirding structures of the design of the system. I contend. We can struggle with that in the question period, if you like. What are you going to do with that? I just dropped something in your lap that you, people don't like to think about. Because if it's a systemic crisis rather than a political crisis, then the name of the game is how do you change the system? If you want outcomes in liberty, democracy, ecological sustainability, etc maybe even community. That's the problem. And we don't know much about that. In fact, most people think, because we are narrow, short-sighted, and because we're realists, maybe, and because we're skeptics, certainly, that you can't change the system. I'll bet most of the people, I'm talking to the person in your chair, I'll bet most of you don't think you can change the system, really. Really, so you know. Cough it up, you understand that. <laughs> and of course, systemic change is as common as grass in world history all the time. So revolutions do happen, fundamental change does occur, and it is not impossible that something like that might or might not occur here. Systems also just decay, and really just decay, and just decay. And the trends go on and on, like Rome, that's also an option. But were you to think that it might be possible to alter the trends, which is what we're thinking about not only in the new economy movement, but in general, if you're interested maybe in possibly democracy, or maybe even liberty, and certainly ecological sustainability, and possibly community, if you were interested in those things, it would be of some import to ask the question whether there is another systemic design, possible even in theory, and possible in terms of dynamic paths from here to there, maybe. 
it would be a good question to chew on if you cared about those values and if you accepted the argument that we live in a systemic crisis, not a political crisis. It is, of course, exacerbated by political crisis. But if that's the problem, you'd have to think about it. And if you accept the argument, as I sh suggest you certainly should, at least for this hour, <laughs> that systems largely around, revolve around who gets to own the capital, then it would be of some interest to be, it would be of some interest to ask, is there a way to own capital that produces maybe a different result? It would also be of some interest to ask whether you could get from here to there. So those are a couple of questions. But notice that the systemic designs probably would have to democratize the ownership of capital in some way other than what well, we have experienced, Soviet Union for instance, or small farmers, that was a democratic own, ownership. Small farmers with the democratization of capital in the small farms. If you wanted a democratic system, and we take the oddity of the social democratic liberal form as it decays away, there would have to be some other structures which democratize the ownership of capital, leaving aside how we get from here to there. It would be a question you'd ask if you were interested in systemic designs that might produce different outcomes. Now, the skepticism doesn't even allow you to ask that question. But if you don't, I'll put it this way. If you're in a systemic crisis and you don't like corporate capitalism, and you don't like state socialism, what the hell do you want? Really? If you buy the, and if you don't ask that question and you think there's a systemic crisis, then you're just playing on the edges because that's the question if we face a systemic crisis. So let me put it to you as the same question another way. If you accept that we face a systemic crisis, not a political crisis, then it is right in your lap and you don't like corporate capitalism, you don't like state socialism for the reasons we're talking about, you either haven't thought about it or you better think about what it is that might produce outcomes in line with your hopeful vision of equality, liberty, democracy, ecological sustainability, and it probably revolves in some way around who gets to own the capital. Nasty stuff. So, I do accept that, the, I, don't, I don't accept that those are the only two systems possible. I suspect there are many variants, and indeed we, we know a lot about variants, but it would be of some interest if you were interested in democracy to begin looking for democratic variants that might give suggestions of what another systemic design might possibly begin to entail. You might begin to look around for bits and pieces that pointed in that direction and maybe then generalize to systemic designs and maybe even talk about pathways and you might begin to en engage that set of very difficult questions even allowing for the fact that you and I are skeptics about, you can't really mean that we're talking about changing the system. Really? <laughs> Ask yourself. I mean, you know, I'm talking to the person in your chair. You don't believe that. Most people don't believe that. They think that's a ridiculous idea. But I have to say, I am a historian and a political economist. And revolutions are as common as grass in world history, or maybe not quite that common, but they happen all the time. If you look back at the long historical sway, and they, they do change. So who knows, maybe us. But one, play, one way to do, begin to look at it is, are there examples that begin to suggest democratizing ownership, which would give us clues to what a systemic design might possibly entail, if perhaps we might be able to build them up over time, step by step along with a political and environmental movement that might begin to offer both elements of design and maybe a pathway and possibly a vision and perhaps one day a real architecture and a sophisticated architecture of the kind that folks in this room and the MIT groups could actually help design. I mean, I want to put the question of systemic design right in the middle of the academy. It's not there at all. So, one of the things we've been doing at the Democracy Collaborative is simply looking around. And it turns out, the first criteria is, is there anything in American culture that suggests democratization of ownership in smaller scale that might give you clues? And in fact, there are lots of things if you look around. I, I assume you know that 130 million Americans are members of cooperatives. 
one person, one vote entities. Substantial number of those, credit unions. Credit unions are one person, one vote banks. And they exist throughout the system. They're common as grass in America. And nobody's gotten too interested in them until recently. I, re I was recently, I've been hearing stories though from, I think this traces to the Occupy movement. Uh, this is a sad sidebar because if you wanted to activate these institutions, they kind of get really interesting. Credit unions on a whole have as much capital taken together as any of the big five banks. They are a big deal. You want capital? Go to the credit unions. Most credit unions in the United States are boring, dumb institutions run by people who don't care about it, make auto loans and housing loans, and haven't got a clue about wanting to change the system. They are deadly. They also are one person, one vote. And they're so boring that no one ever goes to the, uh, the annual meeting to elect the board of directors. No one would bother going there. Any, 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 anyone here ever go? Two people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, they're doing it, maybe they're doing it for the reason the guys in Vermont are doing it. Uh, you can take them over. You can elect the board. And you can begin to use them as an incredible source of capital. And in fact, many places around the country are beginning to say, Hey, I'm going to join the credit union. We've got six friends here. We'll bring some people in. And, hey, we're going to elect our people to the board. <laughs> Scares the hell out of the staff. But there they are. They are accessible sources of large-scale capital. And they exist as a really powerful illustration of a democratically owned form. There are now something like 10.3 million members of the United States workforce. We have one of the experts here working in worker-owned companies. They are called mostly ESOPs, but they exist. There are three million more people working in worker-owned companies in the United States than are members of union in the private sector. Most people don't know that. So that's another sector. There are four or 5,000 neighborhood-owned corporations run in some sense by the neighborhood, depending upon how active the citizenry, citizenry gets in beginning to work with them. And there are dozens and dozens of experiments going on around the country which in one way or another provide some form of social ownership of, of wealth and experimentation. Social enterprise is another one. That is people going into business only to make money, to use the money for a social purpose. There are thousands of those popping up around the country. Now if you go, I'll give you a website. Uh, Community-wealth, put the dash in because there's one without the dash. And if you go there, you will find hundreds and hundreds and literally thousands of examples of this sort of democratizing ownership that's going on around the country without regard to press. One of the reasons you don't know about it is because the American newspapers do not cover it and cannot cover it and don't have the, either the interest or the money to hire reporters to cover this stuff. It is not, not possible for the, Amer the dying American press to cover this. But there isn't, you know, kind of there's something going on in the web, and if you look closely, you can find out about all of this stuff. Another form of this, you all know about the Bank of North Dakota. How many? Yes? North Dakota only has a socialized bank. The state owns the bank. Very popular, very supported. Twenty states have considered and are considering legislation to set up a state bank. It's another form of democratized ownership. And I'll give you another one. Municipalities in this country. 2,000 of them have municipally owned utilities. Boring, dumb, city-owned capital performing, even in the South, the, the usual services of, an, of electricity production and distribution. In fact, 25%, it's really strange, 25% strange, of American electricity is generated by co-ops and, and city-owned public socialized municipality ownership owned utilities. Very strange, right here in America, and many in the South actually doing that. Land is another, so I'm giving you just kind of a taste of what you probably don't see in the press. How many know what a land trust is? Okay, land trusts in 1960s did not exist except one in Vermont, no, not even in Vermont, one in Western Massachusetts, the Vermont one came second, and then one in Southwest Georgia by the Sherrods. And Bob Swan, the guy, the guy started one in Western Massachusetts. Now, a land trust is you draw a circle around the land, you set up a nonprofit corporation of some kind, and you democratize the ownership of land and use it for various purposes, partly to protect it or partly for other purposes, to control land values, for instance, so you don't get gentrification. That is, the price is going up, you put up, you socialize it through a nonprofit corporation. That was regarded as an insane idea 30 years ago. 
and is now all over the country. Irvine, California is doing 5,000 units of housing in a land trust, the socialized form. So I'm suggesting to you, if you look below what the press doesn't cover, and then we're going to ask, we're going to ask the obvious question, is it, does it matter? You're going to see a lot of forms developing in the United States characterized by the proposition that capital or wealth or land ought to be owned in some way by a democratic form, and they are very down home, they are very American, they are very common, and they are growing. Now I'm going to come to the growing part in a, in a minute, but I want to get just the simple point that there's a lot out there to build upon. So that's one of the things to, to get a hold of. Another piece of the puzzle, and this is, this is probably going to be a very interesting one and a very big one for those of you who care about this kind of thing, is that the healthcare system is generating cost structures, as there are probably some experts here who know about what's going on in health, is generating cost pressures that almost certainly cannot be contained either by the Republican or the Democratic variant of the way to handle the problem. So what you're beginning to see is people are being shoved out of small businesses, the prices are going up, the pain levels are increasing, and the only logical way to handle that, I would contend, if we, could, if we have time we could go into the depth of the argument, is some form of quasi-public ownership. It's called single payer, Medicare for all. Where you're beginning to see action on that front is state by state by state, not at the national level. You're seeing it at the pay, where the pain is highest. Vermont just, just moved into single payer. California passed it twice and Schwarzenegger vetoed it, but the pressures that are driving that system are intense and they're producing pain levels and politics that are already leading, and I, can, I suggest to you are likely to continue to lead state by state towards single payer health care. Now what's that got to do with the argument? Single payer health care is a democratic ownership of that sector. And it is 20% almost of the entire economic system. And as that tilts over, that's a big deal. Because that's not small change in terms of who gets to own the capital as that system moves. Now remember, I'm a historian. And for the purpose of this discussion, I really want to look at it as a historian. And from the perspective of historical change, what is interesting is not whether or not you are passing laws in Washington today, but whether or not there are processes developing that may or may not continue in a way that begins to alter larger patterns. So the way to think about this in terms of American history, I'll give you three or four different analogs, none of them perfect, but give you a sense of them. Virtually all of the major changes that occurred in what we call the New Deal were built upon small-scale developments in the states that had developed in the two decades prior to the New Deal, developing knowledge, principles, ideas, and patterns and, for and formats that later were generalized to larger national programs. That's where you got Social Security. That's where you got labor laws. That's where you got minimum wage. That's where you got health safety laws. They were developed in the so-called laboratories of democracy. Or to take another way of looking at it, the women's movement in the 19th century, remember, put your historian's hat on, not your, why isn't it happening tomorrow hat. The women's movement in the 19th century, agonizingly, state by agonizing state by agonizing state by agonizing state, built up until they had enough power to move the national system. That's the kind of way to think about whether or not any of these elements that I'm talking about matter. I said at the outset, and I'm going to come back to it, that I'm a hard-nosed Paul. I've been there, done that, I know what it's all about. I've run 30 campaigns. I've been in 30 campaigns. I haven't run one yet. But I suggest to you the possibility that what you're seeing out of growing pain and out of growing difficulty is the generation of conditions that are because there are no other answers, creating possibilities for the expansion at the local and state level of things that are critically important in beginning to lay groundwork for an alternative systemic model, maybe. <laughs>
Now, if you pay attention, if you like that one, I've just said that in America today, we are beginning, possibly, to generate elements of an alternative systemic design that is radically decentralized, democratizes the ownership of wealth, builds from the bottom up, and might grow to something serious, maybe, over time, we shall see. So let that one sit there for a minute, because the interesting part of the argument, for me, comes now. <laughs> Uh, that, it seems, is a precondition, because were we to build up an alternative model of that kind, and, you know, just let it sit there, over time, we might have an alternative way to think about designing a larger system based on radical decentralization and only, as the Catholic Church puts it, only on the principle of subsidiarity, only moving to higher levels when necessary. Uh, higher levels meaning public or quasi or democratic ownership of larger scale capital. You may have noticed we nationalized General Motors and Chrysler and AIG, the largest insurance company in the world. We still own it, by the way. We did give back General Motors, most of it, and, and Chrysler. We haven't yet given back AIG. But there is another process at work in the banking system, probably in the, not only I mentioned healthcare, but po probably in some of the systemically important parts of the system that are not regulated enough because the old model of regulation, which is based upon progressive politics, which is based upon labor, isn't there to regulate them. That's why the banking crisis occurred. We are likely to see more crises at that higher level of larger structure, in my opinion, and possibly down the line, after many failures, the only answer left is some form of public enterprise like AIG today, but used in different purposes. Now that's, I think, used to be called in Wisconsin where I'm from, that's pie in the sky. Who knows? That's way out there. And I suspect it's very hard to you allow yourself to get over the skepticism that we all take in with the air we breathe that says it is impossible to be realistic about a transformative change in the United States of America because it's all going south and nothing's working and it ain't it bad. And that may be true. So the only suggestion is that you allow yourself, maybe just for this hour, to think the other alternative. And then if you were to do that, you might also begin to ask questions about the emerging this technical term, the nature of the emerging historical context that may or may not permit or drive a change in one or another direction. Now that's kind of funny language. And I would suggest to you that we are entering, and I write about it more in the book, we are entering a particular emerging historical context that ain't like the ones we've been thinking about most of our time. And I'm going to describe it for you because I think it has consequences if my description is even partly right. So for most of the time we have assumed that the way systems operate is they either reform or they collapse and have a revolution. So the reform model is, you know, and many of my liberal friends, I come out of liberalism. I ran House and Senate liberal staffs. I've been there, done that. Most of my liberal friends, and they are my friends, but I don't consider myself easily put in that box anymore, believe somehow, read Robert Reich, for instance, uh, regularly talks this way, but sometimes not. <laughs> sometimes not. Well, the pendulum always swings. We get conservatives, and then the pain gets up, and then liberals come in, and we get a cycle. Arthur Schlesinger Jr., the great liberal historian, thought there was a 30-year cycle. That was a genuine cycle built into the machinery of the system that every time Arthur, his, his very close friend, John Kenneth Galbraith, who used to believe, before his death, who used to believe that labor unions as the basis of what he called countervailing power would in fact produce liberal trend change, 
in the positive direction ultimately we shall overcome, quote, 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 came to conclude 10 or 15 years before his death that that system and that mechanism wasn't working anymore. And that means maybe that it won't reform in the traditional way. That's what those trend lines are about. And that's what the labor collapse is about. It may just decay. Now, the alternative way of thinking about systemic problems of this kind is usually the Marx, one variant of Marxist theory. One variant. And there are lots of different variants of Marxist theory. And that variant suggests that the internal dynamics of the system will generate a collapse. And the collapse, and you know, people have lots of different variations on this, and the collapse will then create a, a counter reaction, and that counter reaction will overthrow the system, maybe. And so that's the scenario to look at. Or a smaller version of that is we'll get something like the Great Depression, which produced the New Deal, which was a modest collapse, not quite a big crisis of the kind that Marxist theory predicted. Uh, some Marxist theories. That's the alternative usually to the cycle of which we shall overcome and that will all work out. And my suggestion to you is that ain't likely either. And the reason is, in the 1929, just before the crash, government was 11% of the GDP. That was the floor holding up the economic system if it began to slip and slide. Government is now 34% or 32%, depends upon where the denominator, the GDP denominator is. And my suggestion is that it will not <coughs> likely collapse. And indeed, corporations and conservative economists also don't want it to collapse. And so they're willing, even when, the, when things get really bad, to follow Keynesian moves and to bail out the banks. George Bush put it very succinctly, I ain't going to let this sucker go down. That was a direct quote. <laughs> direct quote. So that the suggestion to you, very interesting, very interesting if you look at things historically or as a political economist. A system that neither reforms in the traditional liberal way, for the reasons I've just sketched all too hastily, but also doesn't collapse in the traditional Marxist way for the reasons I've sketched all too hastily. Weird, weird. It just is in stalemate, stagnation, and decay. Stalemate, stagnation, and decay. And a lot of pain experienced locally. Now, if you actually look at some of those experiments in democratizing the ownership of capital, what you will find is people in a great deal of pain haven't got any other alternatives, and that's why they're doing it. And if that context, that historical, emerging historical context is of the structure and design I suggested to you, <clears throat> then the probability is that the pain levels will continue in this odd twilight intermediate land, generating conditions in which you can't get there the old ways. And you either innovate or you don't get the result that reduces the pain. Maybe. And my suggestion to you is that that <coughs> may well define the context that may be the prehistory, not the history, the prehistory of decade by decade by decade by decade, much larger change possibly once the laboratories of democracy, if you like, and the prehistory have developed more sophistication and design and features, and even politics in support of the elements that are emerging around the country. So I'm going to give you another way to think about this. And some of you know about the Evergreen Co-ops, yes? Or some people know about the Evergreen, so I'll, have to, I'll describe it to you. Uh, I'll give you a state. The state of Ohio where well, we've done some work recently, and, and indeed for a long time. The state of Ohio is kind of a miniature version, and it's gone through pain over the last 30 years that many parts of the country are now beginning to experience. This is the industrial heartland 
This is where the real difficulties have occurred for a long time. This is where the rust belt is rusty, really rusty. And in 1970, here's, I'm going to tell you the story. 1977, one of the largest mills in the state of Ohio, Youngstown Sheet and Tube, went down. 5,000 people lost their job on one day. Black Monday, they called it. Now, in 1977, 5,000 people losing their job in one day was front page national news in every newspaper and every television show because it hadn't happened in America before. That didn't happen in America. It is now so common that nobody reports it. But in Ohio, Youngstown Sheet and Tube went down, and the workers and the community, highly dependent on this mill, were, you know, at what's end? What are they going to do? People went out into the garage and shot themselves because mm -hmm. they couldn't, you know, not, I don't know how many, but people did do that. And one steel worker, a guy named Gerald Dickey, said, well, why don't we take over this mill and get it up and running? 5,000, it's a big mill, it's not a little mill. And the ecumenical coalition, the religious coalition, got together and they said, yeah, why don't we do that? Why don't we support them? So the notion that the workers, and in this case, worker community ownership, not just worker ownership, but a larger structure that embodied the community too, jointly. That's an interesting design, by the way. We, we can come back to that. We have time and questions. That's an interesting design. Why do we do this? And they got their politics together, and they really organized. They got the National Religious Coalition together. And they got politics in the state of Ohio together. They did all the right work. And they got the Carter administration at that time to give them a couple hundred thousand dollars to do a very, very sophisticated design for how you actually could set, one, set up a new mill. $200,000 in 1977 was a lot of money. It's not, you know, nothing now. And then they got the, and so they came up with a sophisticated plan. They hired the best experts in the field and had a plan to put the mill back up and it would cost $200 million in loan guarantees. Then they got the Carter administration because they did their politics well. To, to promise to give them $200 million in loan guarantees for this sophisticated plan for a worker community owned mill. And then, of course, in the election of 1978, disappeared. Carter didn't need them anymore in the money, by the way. Not surprising, and they weren't surprised. But they knew that the name of the game was to build for the long haul, and they did educational work in a hard-nosed, sophisticated awareness that the name of the game was not going to be one day when the Carter administration gave them a check, but how you built a movement which had different ideas in its head and that might over time overcome. So in the state of Ohio today, you probably find maybe not more worker-owned companies, but an awful lot of worker-owned companies, and you find a little center that's set up at Kent State to help set up worker-owned companies, and you find people know this idea is a kind of ordinary conventional idea that you can do that here, why not? It's conventional in many parts of the country, by the way, and there are big tax benefits when workers, when owners retire and sell to the workers, so that's a very powerful way of doing it. Uh, Chris Mackin here and I can tell you all about that. He's an expert on this. Okay, Chris, he's an expert on it. The, but there, in Ohio, and here's the thing I'd like you to think about. Put on your historian's hat with me and your political economy hat. Put your historian's hat on with it. Over time, the development of that cultural idea and sophistication and awareness and knowledge and technology produced also innovation. So now if you go to Cleveland, you will find a much po more powerful advance on this subject in the Evergreen Cooperative Structures. So Evergreen, so I'll give you a short version <coughs> for those who don't know about it, you will find this is a neighborhood of 40,000, entirely black, average income 18,000, unemployment rate 40%. Let me say it again, 40% unemployed, 18,000, very poor neighborhood. And in the middle of that neighborhood sit Case Western Reserve, the Cleveland Clinic, and University Hospitals, very big, powerful institutions, all of which have lots of taxpayer money in them, Medicare, Medicaid, educational money, they are quasi-public even when they're private. And there they sit. And they buy nothing from that community. Even though those three institutions alone purchase three million billion with a B dollars in goods and services a year. B plus hiring their, their salaries and plus their construction. Just what they buy. So in Ohio, that trend that I've suggested has taken on another form, which is 
the development of a much more sophisticated model, and you will find there a developing complex of worker-owned companies that are linked together by a nonprofit corporation, the purpose of which is to build the community using some of the profits from the worker co-ops that are attached to it, they can't be sold off, and some of the purchasing power of these quasi-public institutions supporting the complex, and all of it is green as can be. That is to say that the, each of the institutions is at, at the highest level of green that they can do. So for instance, oh by the way, they're not little co-ops. We just opened up about a month ago, I think it was, the largest urban um, greenhouse in the United States, hydroponic greenhouse, capable of producing three million, with an M, heads of lettuce a year. Three million, it's the largest one in, in any, any city. Uh, that's 26,000 plantings every day. Imagine, I can't get my head around that. There is a very large scale industrial laundry which services the hospitals. That is one of the greenest laundries in that part of the country. That is to say, use about a third of the water and a third of the heat. And there's a solar installation company which is on, online to put in more solar installation that currently exists in the entire state of Ohio, linked together as a community building structure partly supported by public and quasi-public money. The point of the story is that's in advance both in structure but out of pain, nothing was working in Cleveland. Out of pain, also innovation and, re and expansion of the idea to a much larger and more sophisticated idea. There are 10 cities actively considering doing the Cleveland model. Atlanta's the furthest, furthest along. They're about to set up something called Lettuce Works, which will be another greenhouse <laughs> operation. And there are 10 different cities around the country actively involved, and probably we estimate 100 or so that are really beginning inquiries of this kind. Why? Because nothing else works. And because this model begins to offer a different strategic possibility for many cities. Now let me give you something about the politics of this also, and why as a historian I am cautiously, the word optimism is not right, I'm cool about maybe some interesting possibilities here. And here's why. In 1977, Watch this one, this is really interesting. In 1977, the workers in Youngstown, Ohio, who said, we're gonna set up a worker-owned steel mill here, <laughs> sidebar, uh, Gerald Dickey, the young guy who did it, was talking, you know, he got pulled aside by one of the businessmen in the community in 1977, said, if you're interested in steel, I, I know so much better stocks than this old mill. You're trying to, try to sell them some stock. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned steel mills, sidebar. Um, but that isn't what Gerald was interested in. In 1977, very interesting, the Net International Steel Workers Union, the big union, the national, not the local, was totally against these workers and undercut them at every place they could. They were against workers taking over and they didn't like these upstarts because they, upstarts tend to have a way of challenging national leaders and they wanted, this is brutal, they were quite willing to wipe them out. Screw you, no jobs, we're not interested. And probably, though you can't prove it, they went to Washington to kill the, to kill the deal with the Carter administration. Rough game, the old steel workers were a rough team, as were many of the unions. Now, advance, go forward, et cetera, et cetera, time changes, we're seeing more models in the state of Ohio, worker ownership becomes interesting, expand, we get innovation in Cleveland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The International Steel Workers Union is now proponent, the leading union proponent of worker-owned co-ops and worker-owned companies and is actively pursuing this as a matter of national strategy. Now that's another way to think about evolving possibilities as the dead ends available in the traditional model begin to give you no options other than either innovate and democratize or the pain continues. Now, let me back off again. Um, my time is probably going to get over it while, while I'm kind of giving you kind of all this stuff. But let me, let me give you some more on this and we'll, we'll wipe it up. We'll, we'll wipe it in a little bit. What I think is happening and potentially could become of extreme interest is that as we hit the dead end and as the pain continues and as people innovate and as thereafter a politics of movement building begins to take force along with the institutional shift. Let me say that again. 
We have not yet, you haven't heard me say, movement building politics. Movements also are critical in this, but the question about movements is whether they have anything in their heads. What is it they want? And if you know that the old pendulum swing model isn't there anymore, then what you get is either there is a new model with ha which has different content and systemic design possibilities, or all you got is an amorphous movement. And part and parcel, in my view, of what the new economy movement is beginning to reach for, maybe, I would not go beyond that at this stage, is the sense that if you begin to put this together with the environmental concerns, and the environmental movement begins to take on an institutional vision, and realizes that unless you stabilize communities, I'll give you a couple pieces of this, you aren't going to get there on climate change, and realizes that you're not going to deal with environmental change unless you can stabilize jobs. And the fastest thing that goes when, when, when you've got job questions, the environmental regs go down. If you can put any kind of job in, get a corporation in. When that piece, and it is now moving towards finding some way to put those pieces together, then we may begin to see the development of an idea system. What, what did he just say? An idea system that gives strength and power to the developing movement possibility. We ain't there yet. What people are doing in the so-called new economy movement is probing and looking and beginning to struggle with, are we really talking about systemic change that might alter the trends that we see as outcome trends? And if so, is there a path from here to there? Now, you don't want to mess with this stuff if you don't want to play serious politics, because that's a very difficult and painful, very high order set of questions to mess with. But that's what I think is going on in the new economy movement. And it's got lots of parts. Some people just like what I call project and projectism. And some people like systemic visions. And some people like just climate change. And we don't want to mess with Bill McKibben doesn't want to do what I just said. Bill McKibben is so concerned with climate change and doesn't want to get into this question. We haven't got time, he thinks. I think you can't deal with climate change unless you do what we're talking about. But nonetheless, there is a probing and a dialogue and a beginning opening up, reaching out to different parts of the community, to black and brown people who are in a different struggle, to labor people who also are facing dead ends in what it was they thought liberalism and social democracy and reform could give them. So just think about it. You may possibly, I'm talking to the person in your chair, you may possibly be living, maybe, at the turning point in which the foundational questions of building a movement, given the specific nature and unusual context of the historical context, given the dead ends of the labor movement, given the challenges, you may just possibly be living in a period where the foundations, not more, of the next great transformative American transformation, call it a revolution or an evolution, are being laid. Maybe. Nobody ever knows the answer to that question, by the way, in advance. Did you know that? Including those guys around the corner who had the American, nobody ever knows that in advance. You can't know that in advance. You pay your money and you, you know, take your shot. On the other hand, the very little to lose by assuming that might be possible. And instead of simply thinking in terms of projects, I like projects. I think you need projects. But I'm against projectism, where what we're really doing is a project. And don't tell me about that other stuff, because you ain't going to get there with projects. Though you need them as a basis of knowledge to build a movement sufficiently powerful to transform the trends. So that's another way of looking at it. And the last piece of this, if I say last piece, don't trust me. Because <laughs> I'm known to go on. Another piece of this puzzle is that, and I'll give you just a couple more bits because I think our time is running up. If you really want to deal with either growth or climate change, here's where it gets really rough. 
because people don't want to do this. American large corporations, like all large corporations, must grow. If they don't, Wall Street will kill them. So they have to grow. And if you think growth is a problem, ultimately, then your design is also going to have to deal with making some of these into public utilities that don't have to grow. Now, that's probably much further down the line, but those environmentalists here who are interested in growth or degrowth, you better think about that. Because that really means that these elements of decentralized paradigm shifting possibility, democratized capital, et cetera, in states and localities, blah, 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 the bottom line at the end of the name is the big corporation cannot do it for you. You can't regulate it, it has to grow. And so, fellow socialists, the model looks like a radically decentralized community building, small scale wherever possible. The Catholic Church used the term subsidiarity. Whatever can be done locally, you do locally, and only go higher if you have to. But it also probably includes, on the basis of radical decentralization, wherever possible, and the reconstruction of community wherever possible, it also probably includes some forms of public ownership of the, big, of the big guys. And it's a kind of new model. It's kind of real American in its qualities. It starts with communities. It's kind of, you know, in a funny way, my European friends kind of go, they look at me cross-eyed when I say this, because they're all ahead of us in social democracy. All the trends are better in you know, France and Sweden and Norway. I say, you know, we may get there before you will. What? We're, I'm, we're way at the bottom on all the trends, way on all of the major trends. I said, yeah, because why? It's because two things. The paying levels in the United States are growing much faster than you guys because you've got a better welfare state, and people are being forced more than you guys to look at new models, and probably will be forced. And secondly, there is something in American culture that is kind of roll up your sleeves, let's do it at home, let's get on with it, that is different from French culture, for instance, and different from Swedish culture. So I'm not totally pessimistic about the possibilities of the American cultural format and where we might go with this. So now the, this probably, I'll give you one more and this will be the last one, but don't trust me. Which is, I want to, because I'm going to give it a little bit more on the climate change. You can't deal with climate change unless you make them into public entities, I, I contend, at some point. Whoa. And secondly, if you look at what the major corporations do in the United States because it is more profitable and because they have to satisfy their shareholders, they tend to go into a community like Cleveland. It was 900,000. It's now just a little under 400,000. They get all the tax credits they can. They use them, and then they get up and go. And then they do that to Detroit, and, it, and that's just the nature of how, you know, that's, that's how they got to make their money and satisfy their stockholders. So they, here's the term, they literally, not figuratively, literally throw away cities. All the capital, the housing, the hospitals, the schools where people are there, and then they've got to build it someplace else because the corporation moves the jobs. That's not a good way to solve problems of either capital or carbon very carbon costly to do that. Now you want to contain that one and you can't regulate them? You're back to a different model. So my suggestion to you, if you look these kind of funny little problems in the face and you think about the historical context and you permit yourself the possibility of thinking that we just possibly may be at the foundational point in maybe opening a transformative direction you might find yourself talking about democratizing wealth in a lot of ways as the preliminary ingredients of the next American transformation, or maybe just because it's a good thing to do to help people, if that's all you get done, that wouldn't be so bad either. Thank you very much. I'll throw you one of my problems. One of the things I'm worried about. Sir. Sp stand up and loudly, please. Loudly. Hi. Um, 
Comment, question, comment. Uh, I'm the co-founder of two cooperatives. Uh, large reason I started them was because of you, so. Uh oh, <laughs> when he says that. <laughs> well, no, just your older writing. But <laughs> before you were really. <laughs> the second question is, I often advocate for cooperatives to liberals, and they always ask me the same question, which is like, what is the stop work cooperative from doing the same things that uh, large corporations do? And there's easy answers like, oh, why would they pick up and move jobs when they, would, they wouldn't want to hire themselves, et cetera, et cetera. But there are real questions like, why would a woman cooperative not use Chinese slave labor, for example? It's not their jobs. Like, why, what, what is, in your mind, the reason for cooperatives have a, a better defense mechanism against outsourcing labor to China and other places to save money? Okay, so re that's a really, that's one of the questions I'm really interested in. But by and large, worker co-ops have the, one, well, they are anchored locally. So worker-owned companies actually live in communities and they don't get up and move. They tend to feel, they tend mostly to hire their own, but not always. So worker-owned companies are not, and that's a really good question. There's a kind of, let me just footnote it. There's kind of a buzz now. We all should bet worker-owned co-ops and worker-owned companies. That's the answer for everything. And you're going to hear a lot about it. And I'm cautious about that. So I think that the question, for instance, if you can't stabilize the economy in a larger sense, you're going to run into these same kinds of problems, including externalizing costs, environmental problems. So you are right at the heart in that question of how we get design features that try to internalize and contain that. That's what's interesting about Cleveland, because it is, notice that the Cleveland model is a community building model, the goal of which is to build the community economy and it subordinates worker ownership to that model, thereby giving some purchase on the problem you just addressed. The whole goal is to build the community, not simply to make some workers rich, so that there's a different possible cultural pro possibility in that larger design. He's, ra he's raising, I think, the cutting edge question in terms of what's gonna happen with worker ownership, because it can become worker capitalism that does the kind of things. In the, the, the models we know about in the United States, about co-ops, there were pl famous plywood co-ops in the Northwest. Some, probably two or three people in this room may know about that experiment. And if you actually, and it was a very democratic experiment, worker-owned co-ops. Um, and if you looked internally, the attitudes that were generated by it were not particularly dem democratic, and they were not particularly liberal. They were, if you look, as a friend of mine says, if you looked at what their attitude structure was at, out of that experience, they all looked like small-scale Republican politics policy. So the question is not simply worker ownership, in my opinion. I think there's a larger set of questions that goes to community building. But that's right, I'm just finishing an article right on that subject. And you guys, that's the cutting edge question. Uh, worker ownership's important, but it ain't the answer, in my opinion. Sir. So Chicago, history. Uh, Jack Kemp went in to one of the public housing buildings, and they said, why don't you let us fix our own stuff? We live here. And so the out-of-work carpenters, the out-of-work electricians, and so on, started fixing up the place. The interesting thing was people had more pride in their own place, because if you did bad work, you were going to hear about it from your neighbors. Um, it also led to uh, mentoring. The olders would teach the youngers, because they were fixing, in a sense, their own hive, if you will. So Jack Kemp did that. Uh, in Chicago, on the west side, the vice lords would turn from a gang into a business by David Dobby, who I think lives in Somerville. So there are models from the past about people flipping a social organization, mm -hmm. creating more internal integrity, more buy-in, and more it's more of a nested model. Mm -hmm. And when you have the concept, when you face the consequences, you don't need a regulator. Mm -hmm. You'll hear about it. So I'm wondering whether that model is coming to life in places like Cleveland where they're formally using those very conservative models from the past and saying, let's use that structure, let's bring it back, but let's also use the affordances of the internet, like cell phones, so that work teams could be more like musicians. Yeah. Hey, we have an electrical gig, can you can you come and do it? Yeah. We have a food gig, can you come and do it? Yeah, there's a, there are two aspects of it that we respond to on two different levels. Anybody know about ADP in Western Massachusetts? It's, there is an organization that's doing that in very large scale in Western Massachusetts, a liberal organization. 
starting with a housing project and building co-ops out of it and other projects out of it. By the way, if you lift the lid on this, there's experimentation going on everywhere in the country. And you, he's just talking about it. There's also a very interesting thing. Now, you may have noticed possibly that I am from the left, <laughs> maybe. But at the local level, you will find what I call genuine conservatives who are not the stereotypes you hear on the national radio. That's, it's a different breed of genuine, of serious-minded people who are consider themselves conservative. And in a city like Cleveland, the business guys will help you establish worker ownership of the means of production because they believe it helps the community and helps these people. Just insane. So the stereotypes begin to dissolve if you actually are talking. And here's the key to it: Is it practical? Mm -hmm. Is it a airy fairy, or is it real? If it's real, you'd be surprised what you can do in terms of coalition building at the local level, building on some of these ideas. Sir. Uh, what, what have you learned, um, both positive and negative, from working with longer dogs in these kind of situations, and what can you take to build this one thing? People know about Mondragon? How many do? Well, that's people. So for those of you who don't know, Mondragon is in the Basque regions of Spain. It's a very complex integrated set of, set of co-ops integrated into an 85,000 person multinational corporation, but it's a co-op. Uh, we actually take people from Cleveland, from people who are janitors as well as presidents of banks out to see Mondragon because they think a co-op is some little dinky thing. Mondragon is giant, highly successful corporation that does everything from construction and medical equipment and high-tech things to, to you know, stores and so forth. Um, another piece about the puzzle. Mondragon, here's what you can do, because Mondragon does do this. The average wage dis differential from top to bottom in 85% of, there are about 85 co-ops in an integrated <coughs> structure. About, about 85 to 100,000 people, depending upon when you look at it. So in 80% of the co-ops, the top to bottom income structure is six to one. American corporations, 200 or 300 to one. Now there are a couple bigger ones in the Mondragon structure that are a little bit different. They're eight to one. So it's an extraordinarily efficient, high tech, cooperative structure and a cooperative culture operating out there. Uh, and we have, many people have learned from Mondragon. In the Cleveland model, the model that particularly is interesting, the revolving fund that helps produce, the goal is to build more and more, so there's a revolving fund that the co-ops kick some money into and they're gonna start new co-ops every year. And so, so the revolving fund is based on the Mondragon model. Also some of the profits go in to help the community, into the nonprofit corporation. So we've used that, and Mondragon is a very important experiment. And that's part of the steel workers operation, by the way. They've joined up with Mondragon to try to spread the model here. Kirk, if uh, could you give us a little more Chris color Matthew. on uh, your hypothetical dialogue with Bill McKibben, if he uh -huh. was sitting there, <laughs> and, uh, and why, how do you challenge him? And I agree with you, I think. I just want to hear a little more. Well, uh, you know, I, I have nothing but great sure. respect for, for, yeah. for Bill McKibben, and I don't know, don't know him very well, but I do know his work. And if you read this book called, I can't pronounce it, somebody else has Earth, you know, it's got two E's and A's, because he thinks the Earth isn't what it used to be, so he titled this book Earth. Um, he ends up saying, we, the, goal, the goal cannot be, we don't have time to do transformation of the system. What we have time to do is important new projects that will deal with the environment and will deal with climate change. And so he's against what I'm talking about. As a, my, what I'm suggesting to you is you can't get there from here unless you change the system. And secondly, there's a lot of reasons to believe that maybe it ain't as close as you think. And nonetheless, if, and third, if you pursue this direction, it's all positive anyway. That's, that's, the, that's the sermon, right? So Bill doesn't want to do that. He says, we haven't got time for that. And so he's interested in building a movement, which I support, to stop the CO2 and to stop all of the carbon problems that are going on and stop this. Now that's a traditional movement technique and he is against the systemic design. He wants to pursue that full force. We don't have time. And I think he's wrong. I think we don't have time, but that's the only way to get there is by changing the system. So I think he should not be talking about that in books. I think he should be opening, his, opening himself and others 
to walking on two legs, to do whatever you can by movement building, whatever you can that way, but ultimately you want to deal with this problem, honey, there's no way to do that unless you change the system. So that's where I am with building activity. This, this side of the room, dead? <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, from my point of view, it's the right, but from your point of view, it's the left. So we got to come up. Okay, sir. Do you have any opinion about what sort of political reforms would help uh, advance this sort of thing? Do you know anything about liquid democracy or what you think the role of the government, of the internet and the future governance is, anything along those lines? Yeah, I think the internet really helps us. I mean, boom, you get information that's really being spread fast and people are using it and feeling a movement building. Uh, I think the down dirty at home local stuff is really critical and state and state development is all critical. But uh, and the new technologies are going to play a role in all of this as well as we begin to integrate them into these model building. Um, so I'm only I don't have anything so at all sophisticated to say about it. I just think that it's all plus that we, we can use it. There was another hand here, sir. I, I wanted to dig more deeply into the um, question of uh, how we address climate change and other environmental challenges. The two mechanisms you said by which you know we need um, this movement towards more collective ownership are community stabilization and also increased sort of jobs and just broader economic security and it's those two things and I agree with you completely that we need to have um, or to give us a better chance of having a really robust environmental policy it does seem to me that there's lots of ways within sort of the existing corporate capitalist structure we can make the kind of inroads we need to in environmental policy. So, you know, increasing rate of energy efficiency, the deployment of renewable energy, uh, better land use, you know, in right. each and every state. So I'm wondering about how we can um, better, I guess, uh, marry the messaging and interests of the environmental movement that needs to take on these sort of short-term fights to, let's say, win a clean energy standard the next couple of years, whatever the policy is while also building this kind of broader alliance between these two different types of yeah. movements. If you can expand on that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I, I'll take whatever I can get yeah. in the old way. Yeah. I mean, when one should not be in any way against the tradition. But the senator I work for is Gaylord Nelson, the guy who started the funded. I was, ran his legislative shop, was his legislative director. Gaylord Nelson was the guy who started Earth Day. So that's, I come out of that tradition. That's what we did. And we should do that as wherever we can. Walk on two legs is what I sometimes say but not to the detriment of building this other idea. And some, and some parts of the corporate community are quite open to allying. And some parts of the wealth holding community, sort of, there's investment of all kinds, impact investing, social investing. I keep running into, indeed, to speak to conferences of very, very wealthy people who want to do this stuff. And they know that the name of the game is change institutions, not just try to regulate the old ones. And then there are some guys who are what I call good guy corporations that the people at the top care about this. And, but nonetheless, the dominant force is not that. So you got to kind of figure out ways to build where you can with full, without ducking the real hard question, in my view. Sir. Um, so I know a lot of like, mainstream economists um, feel that developing economies are basically dependent on the capital provided by multinational corporations in the United States to develop and, and grow. So I was wondering how you describe systemic changes, if you could place them in a global context and maybe describe how, how it would affect developing economies and, you know, that a little bit. The answer is no. <laughs> I, I feel like, and I'm, and I'm very reluctant to get into that, and I'll tell you why. I think privileged white Americans who haven't really thought about the, the nature of the problem in very specific situations in specific countries, don't know what they're talking about. And so I have looked over the shoulder. I, when I was a state, high State Department official, I saw what was happening and I was involved in some of it. And I'm very queasy about kind of offering people advice in countries I don't really know anything about. So when I worked in the government, now, after not the Senate part, but in the policies planning stuff in the State Department, you know, we come up with really good ideas for AID to help third world countries. And mostly by the time it hit the ground, the corporations had twisted it into something else. So I'm very cautious about that and, and dubious. Uh, I, I don't feel qualified to answer in an intelligent way. Sir. I am, um, I gave this talk in uh, 1980, maybe 25 times. 
And I also worked for Gaylord Nelson. You did. Helped found the National Center for Employee Ownership and all of that. Yeah. And wrote many bills on uh, spreading capital ownership, Lewis Kelso, and all of this kind of a thing. And I can't help but notice that we're exactly in the same place. <laughs> that is, if you look from the perspective of employee ownership and community ownership, ESOPs, C CSOPs, and everything else, it's grown enormously looking from our having <coughs> nothing. But if you look at what's trying to be accomplished in the general workforce, it's still um, minuscule. Minuscule. It, it, I don't even know. It's minuscule, <laughs> and it's the ambulance driver for capitalism in a certain way. You know, it tries to rescues a few things. Mondragon was being talked about then. The Youngstown, Ohio thing was talking about. It's like listening to the Paris Commune <laughs> being discussed in the history of anarchism. The only thing that's ever happened, lasting about a pregnancy. Good. You know, I and, like and this I'm wondering why, <laughs> why this has not, um, it has not, I can imagine people saying, well, it didn't work. It just has failed. Mm -hmm. The left loves it, the right loved it even more. I was there during the Reagan administration, the Small Business Committee. They loved it. We're spreading capitalism. We're getting everyone interested. No one was against it. Bills passed like nothing. But what happened? Why hasn't this grown enormously that's rather a, than been? It's a good question. I mean, that's, a, that's an honest question about systemic change, which I uh, thank you for that. So my view, I have a view on that. And it is what I, I'll reiterate it just so I can put it on the table. My suggestion to you is that we have entered a period where the decaying power of labor to modulate the system sufficient to make it not something that people really take seriously has, design, has dissolved. And that the pain levels, unlike the period you're talking about, which I also lived through, mm -hmm. unlike that period, I do not see answers for the problems that the Clinton administration gave in a particular way using heavy duty capital investment and mm -hmm. bankrupting the system, et cetera. I don't see easy answers for the system, system itself to manage. So my contention is that we are entering an era in which, for reasons I've sketched all too sh shortly, but which you'll find in this wonderful book for sale over here, <laughs> uh, that we have entered a period different from the one you're describing, and that the pain levels cannot offer answers. You know, I, I don't like to say it this way, but I enjoy saying it this way. So let me say it. It's like rats in a maze. You can't get out the door any other way, and there's only one door that might open, and it's a little, little tiny door that might or might not give you a way out, but that door is open, and the pain levels are growing. So I think all the doors are closing, and that there may be a possibility. Now, you also may be, which is the implication, which I, you also may be right, that, that there's nobody to get from here to there. Rome did decay. But if there's a way, my contention is it's down this kind of a path somehow, because the old pattern of labor, et cetera, for the balance of the system is highly unlikely. Sir. You said a couple of times that revolutions in human history are very frequent. But in my rather uneducated <coughs> view of history, weren't most of, most of those accompanied by violence? And if kind of the rats in the maze analogy, if the only way out is through this radical decentralization, I would say there's two ways out, one better than the other, I and mean, the other one is violence. Is there a way to avoid that? Is that the role of the, st the state in this process to prevent that? Or well, They certainly will try. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I think, that, I think that the potential for violence is very high. And the only violence we've seen in recent years is white violence in Oklahoma City, not black or brown. Interesting, it's quiet. So I think the potential of violence is very high, and I think it's going to get very bloody if that happens. But that also isn't the end of history. So I, I, I think it's important to look at. Now, let me make, let me e escalate your question to this, because the next step in that argument usually is then there will be repression, and with repression we will lose our liberties, which is true, or some people will, and and therefore this is the next sentence. And therefore. You can't go there. So those of you who want to think about that, look to Latin America. Because there were dictators everywhere. And lots of them are gone now. 
<coughs> that may also be our fate. I don't know. I, I'm op opening a historic thoughts, not political. That is, the historical possibility may include violence, repression, and going through that phase and then on beyond to the next phase. History is a long-term thing. So by the way, I said, <laughs> you want to play this game? You know the chips are. You don't want to play this game unless you want to throw the chips on the table. They, they are decades of your life. <laughs> We're talking about long-term change in the most powerful corporate capitalist system in the history of the world. You want to play that game, you're not going to do it quickly. You're going to do historic change, and it's that kind of change. And don't mess with it unless you understand what you're trying, what you're trying to do. Although it's also useful to do projects. I like projects. <laughs> no, no. I'm not against projectism, projects or projectism, but I, the real name of the game is transformation. Yes? So kind of building on this question, I'm, I'm interested, so if, if the idea is that the, the gradual change is happening through lots of bubbling experiments happening on the ground, I'm interested in how the movement learns from itself and how what mechanisms are in place for people to be understanding, especially if this is on a long time horizon, which of these institutional experiments are working better than others? And you know, are we are we putting all of our energy equally into all of them and kind of hoping that all are equally high impact? Or are we starting to learn that some are more high impact than others? And can you tell us about that? That's an MIT question. <laughs> Good. Yeah, no, I think we need, we need to learn. Uh, the only qualification, I mean, we need people to do graduate work and thesis and study this stuff and learn and tell us what we, what's working but not in the traditional way. Because some, uh, which means, well now we've learned because this one works and that one doesn't. Part of this is a learning developmental political process in which the answer may, not, may even be failure is positive. So it's a very tricky kind of analysis. Not, the usual parameters have to be expanded to include movement building and learning and development and failure. I mean some of the corporations understand that failure is a very important part of learning and so they don't look just at winning indicators. So if you're going to do this, please do it real intelligently uh, in a way that contributes more. One more. I think one. we're getting kind of to the end. One yeah, more another like, couple questions, and then we'll leave some time for book signing and chatting. Way back there. Kind of question. Uh, following up on the question about it, it was the same 30 years ago, why hasn't it gotten better? How many phone calls or interviews have you got in the last 10 years compared to 30 years ago on this specific subject as a, as a, as a barometer for how yeah. Idea. No, that's really interesting because um, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> Amongst other things that I've been doing. <laughs> but um, lots of other things. I, as some of you know, I'm a historian of nuclear weapons, and so there's a whole other part. Uh, I, let me answer your question this way. I have never seen as much interest in this stuff ever as has happened in the last several years. And I, I mean, calls, lectures, writing, conferences everywhere, really good work being done in different places. Every time you turn around somebody, I mean now particularly every time you turn around there's 10 new experiments that I, nobody's ever told, told you about. Something is a brewing and I, I think it's because it's not only that we've reached the dead end of the kind that I've tried to sketch and it's kind of all too quickly sketched, but people are getting the idea from other people that you could do something and it's kind of ex explosive. Now that doesn't mean it will go on. You know, this could stop, and there may be another hiatus, and maybe there'll be another startup. But at the moment, this stuff is really hot. I mean, I mean, I've never seen as much activity and concern and interest and explosion and academic work and movement building. And it's, it's really interesting. And we're at the center of information. You know, we have this center at the University of Maryland, and we just keep seeing more and more and more stuff on this that that it's not covered by the press. So, another way to say that is you should discount everything I say because we get a lot of information and you never can tell how important the stuff is, but we, we are at the center of a lot of flow, so I'm, I may have exaggerated because I see so much of it. So be cautious about believing all this junk here and I'm up here. <laughs> there was, any other question? There was, yes sir, you one more, I think. Oh, and then yet, the two more, that was it. Go ahead. You're on. Okay, um, so you mentioned uh, there go, uh, 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 when the international question came up about privileged white Americans kind of leading change. And I'm wondering, um, in the United States, you know, I think that a lot of this new economy movement is also kind of driven by privileged white Americans. So one, I guess my question is, how um, is the movement not um, 
how does the movement not kind of stop once privileged white Americans stop experiencing pain? Because I think if you look at the swing of history, like now is a moment where a lot more pain is being felt, and so that's kind of where we see the movement happening. But a lot of communities of color have been struggling, you know, throughout. And so how, you know, once you kind of relieve that pressure, does the movement not just stop? And two, how is the movement kind of being respectful and inclusive of communities of color, making sure that fundamental power relations are actually shifting until it's the same one. I, I don't think the movement's going to stop, just to pick up that little fragment, uh, for the reasons I've said. You know, we, may, you know, we may have hiatus and so forth. For the reasons I've said, I think there's a systemic crisis of the, because of the architectural change that I described. But your real question, I don't have an answer to that question. I think the, the people that have been active, most active in all this have been white young people privileged people and they've been kind of leading the charge. However, the most interesting experiments are now developing in brown and black communities in some parts of the country. So I don't, I don't know whether or not, those of you who want to read wh where the real action could be, read Du Bois in 1934. He was on to all of this. If you read the, in the fight he had with the NAA, he was on to community building, cooperatives, worker owned, et cetera, et cetera, in the black community because the only way forward. But I haven't yet seen that to picked up in the black or brown community in a, as a serious movement building strategy. If it doesn't, we're in trouble. And I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I think, you know, the white part of this movement ought to be more sensitive and ought to be more inclusive. But I don't think that's what's going to really count. It's going to count when actually black and brown people actually start doing it and making it happen more. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to happen. So uh, there ought to be more inclusive. But the real power is when people actually realize they got to get get it going, and it's not happening. But we'll see. I was at I had the um, I, I went on this book tour. I had the privilege of I, I used to work with, with a little bit with Dr. Martin Luther King, so I had the privilege of speaking at the uh, at the Martin Luther King Memorial Library in the week of the assassination that, last week. And there's a whole lot going on in Atlanta, which is black, and very interesting. So a lot, the, the audience was about 85 percent black, and there's a lot of stuff going on there. And then I went up to Highlander. You guys all know what Highlander? How many of you know what Highlander is? Highlander is the famous training ground for the civil rights movement, and up before that, the left part of the, the CIO of the labor movement. And they're they're beginning the same thing going on, black and white, and, and also Hispanic co-ops and worker-owned companies and land trusts and trying to figure out how to do it. So we shall see, but it will not happen unless people actually make it happen. So we'll see. I've seen some some sprouts, but I don't have an answer. I guess we have Dana. I was just gonna, um, My friend Dana Cummingham, you all may know her. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I was just going to respond a little to Dana and um, so at the MIT collab, we are doing some of this work inspired by Gar and instructed by Gar. And, um, but, and I think one of the questions we get a lot is how are you different from the new economy people? Mm -hmm. The collab or me? <laughs> um, so, how is collab different from uh -huh. the economy? And um, and I think one distinction that we think about is that um, collab and kind of our strand of this work is really trying to look at the connection between politics, political structures, movement building, identity-based movement building, and economic transformation and and trying to explore the connection between um, you know how does um, movement building in the traditional civil rights sense actually lead you as it did Du Bois to a framework around economic transformation not leaving the politics out of it and I think that is a point of productive engagement for the new economy movement and whether what we are calling economic democracy, I don't know what to call it. And I don't want to draw a sharp distinction that creates a schism. But I do want to raise that there is this, there's um, this interest beyond um, structures, you know, of, of innovative structures to how politics feeds that. I don't know if that means that. No, no, that, that's a really critical um, corrective that, uh, of what I've been saying. This is not going to get anywhere unless what, unless what she's talking about happens. That is to say that it, we are in a stage where we need lots of models. We really need them. 
that are sophisticated and developed and so forth. Hey, they did it over there, why can't we do it here? That's what the Cleveland thing is. Hey, they did it in Cleveland, why can't we do a better one? You guys are doing one in the Bronx and hopefully it'll be better. But we need those models. But the next stage in this has got to be movement building. It's just got to be. And that has, that's, and the historical evolution hasn't gone that far yet. But it's got to happen. And you guys, CoLab is the leading part of the country on this stuff. You've got it right here. Well, you are. Don't, don't give me our Well, you are. I mean, the, the truth is, CoLab at MIT is leading the country in this respect, and you ought to know that. Talk to Dana. Yeah. No, I, think, I, I can understand this, because this is absolutely the center of privilege and where pain is not going to be felt. I mean, there was a city council meeting last six hours last night where the councilors finally voted to let MIT, you know, have its zoning upgrade. It's been working for forever, but, you know, like... I didn't say MIT was the center. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that CoLab is a little hole. Well, CoLab is part of MIT, and we heard from all the big guys at MIT. We heard the governor send his economic development sure. czar, and who said, oh, we got to do this so we can compete with New York. Yeah. You know, and they're avoiding the fact, you know, sea level rise is going to wipe out this whole area before the end of the century. So. Let it not be said that I defended MIT in this particular okay. fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's MIT, it's Cambridge. I'm yeah. Cambridge. Right okay, Cambridge. Cambridge. You know. Let it not be said. Okay. <laughs> that would be a discussion for the next okay. one. Okay. One more and then we're done? Yeah. A quick follow-up to that. You were going to give us curious. a crazy idea. What? You are going to give us a crazy idea that you, that after the Q&A Oh, um, I have one. <laughs> so, I, the COLAP does fabulous work, but I just want to ask a question. If, if entertainers can create, this is a market, okay? He's about to sell books, that's a market. If we can create markets, do we really want to involve politics in all this? Like, it why go, right? Why not create as many markets as possible? as one of the models without the politicians, because then the politicians have to scramble to get out in front. Because I think it's idealism to think that um, politics is an everyday structure in markets. And um, structuring policies that determine who are the winners and losers in markets. Yeah. So I yeah, so I just think it's it's real I mean that's just real life. I well I'm just saying that a lot of the internet has created has taken the brick and mortar model which is traditional institutional thinking, and leveled it. And I actually think the students in here understand how to make markets, because they do it by spending their time and attention on these. So my question is, is this the place to organize? That's a piece of it. We shouldn't ignore it, but, but it's a No, maybe the majority of it. That's what right. I'm saying. It may be the majority <laughs> you, you, you are you are You are allowed to test this hypothesis anytime you like. <laughs> so, so. Um, I know. Um, I, <laughs> I welcome you all to keep coming to our lunch discussion series, where this is part of an active debate that we're having. It's not just, the point is not just to have one lecture, but to actually build a community of people who are interested in exploring these issues and continuing to engage in scholarship and research and debate and arguments where necessary. So I would like to thank Gar for coming tonight. Have a So we're gonna we're gonna do books, but he asked me to say something crazy that I was gonna say yeah. crazy. So here's the task: look in the mirror tomorrow morning and ask yourself if you if the person in the mirror is willing to spend one hour a week on any of this. That's the test. Oh. <laughs>